This is the SFF Audio Podcast. I'm Scott. I'm Jesse. How's it going? I'm all right. Good. Um, have you heard of a website called 42 Blips? No, I have not. Okay. 42 Blips is like um, some sort of um, offshoot of Dig. Yeah, I've heard of Dig. I haven't done anything with Dig. Dig's like, uh, you know, takes stories from around the internet and people vote them up or vote them down. Mm-hmm. Um, and that makes it like uh, it's a user-generated news site where the more popular something is, the more more likely it is to get voted up. Uh huh. Or something like that. Anyways, uh, 42 Blips is is uh, like that for uh, science fiction websites. And oh, okay. Uh, out of uh, 150 or so websites uh, about science fiction, what number do you think we're at? We are number three. Ah, uh, unfortunately, not true yet. Ah, uh, darn it. Yeah, we started off as number 52. Uh, when I got an email from uh, one of the people running it, and now we're up at number 30. So we're moving Ooh, our way nice. up, but we've got a few, a few people ahead of us. Hey, uh, big new release this week. What's that? An audio event. Ah, <laughs> M- I know what you mean. Metatropolis um, from Audible. By Jay Lake, John Scalzi, Elizabeth Bear, Tobias Bakel, and Carl Schroeder. Or Schro- I don't know how you pronounce his last name. That sounds right. We got an advanced copy in the mail this Woo-hoo! week, and I've been I've been listening to it, but I'm halfway through it. So I've heard uh, Jay Lake's story and Tobias Bakel's story, and half of Elizabeth Bear's story. Audible has the first one for free. Have you listened to that? I posted, but I haven't heard it yet. I I heard an excerpt oh. from it, but I haven't. Okay. Uh, sat down and listened to it. I've been listening to something else that's going to be on Audible soon. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Um, Spaceship. By Mr. Spaceship. Philip that's Kedic right. And yes. read by Stefan Rudnicki. Which yeah, I think is pretty the great amazing. Stefan Rudnicki. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's really great. That's yeah. done by Wonder Audio. Yep. Uh, yeah, Rick sent yeah. me a copy of that. and uh, He actually sent me uh, a copy of the ebook, and I'm saying, dude, is this going to be on audio? And he said, <laughs> Speak no more. And he sent me yes. a copy there. Yeah, so that All was right. awesome. Um, and I was looking at the cover art. The cover art looks really good too. But as I'm listening to the story, I'm going, I don't think this really matches. Um, uh-huh. but then getting closer to the end, I'm saying, wait a second here, maybe it does. Hmm. So, um, it's it's pretty good story. Um, it's uh, not to give it too spoilery, I think. But uh, one of the main ideas is kind of like. Uh, uh, Anne McCaffrey's The Ship Who Sang. Uh huh. So, um, it's, it's sort of a Philip K. Dick version of that. So, tell me more about uh, Metatropolis. Metatropolis, yeah. It's um, it says, Welcome to a world where big cities are dying, dead, or transformed into technological megastructures, where once thriving suburbs are now treacherous wilds, where those who live for technology battle those who would die rather than embrace it. It is a world of zero-footprint cities, virtual nations, and armed camps of eco-survivalists. So yeah, in the, in the first story, In the Forest of Night by Jay Lake, you know, that one's read by Michael Hogan, mm-hmm. who plays Colonel Ty in uh, Battlestar Galactica. And his reading is just like Colonel Ty. <laughs> uh, it's, know, which, that's which just is, his voice. It's yeah, his voice. exactly. Exactly. It and it, you know, it's a good reading. Um, but In the Forest of Night is... Um, it's it's really good, but it, it's very info dumpish. Um, there is a lot of information about the history of what happened, um, you know, between where we are now and where these stories take place. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of that. Um, you know, it's like a little bit of story. Okay, now we're going to talk about the history. A little bit of story, a little bit of history, a little story, a little bit of history. So Jay Lake um, basically tells us that the American experiment has failed finally. Mm-hmm. Um, he compared it to uh, 18th century Spain when um, 
which basically just struggled un under its own weight. I mean, there was so much uh, empire that, you know, it was impossible to... They had adorned themselves in too much gold they couldn't move. Exactly, exactly right. And not only that, but they lost their will, too. Uh, it was like uh, kind of a what's-the-point type of deal. And um, anyway, he likened it to that. And, um, you know, of course, he talks about, you know, the economy failing and... Um, how prescient of him. <laughs> <laughs> you bet, you bet. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, his story takes place in a place called Cascadiopolis, which is, it's it's somewhere in the region, I, I think it was in Oregon, mm -hmm. um, somewhere in the region of uh, Cascadia, which I guess is, um, what, it, Oregon, Washington, all the way to Vancouver? Yeah. Is that called Columbia, Cascadia? Columbia, Idaho, maybe, if if you're lucky. Um, I'm I'm in Cascadia. Yeah, I I think what the idea is is think of the Rocky Mountains, and mm -hmm. the Cascades, the cascade, <coughs> cascading melting waters. I guess everything east of the Rockies on the west mm. coast, uh, down to uh, I've heard as far as uh, San Francisco. Um, I see. The idea yeah. being, uh, we should form our own country, <laughs> right? Just just right. w west of the Rockies. Gotcha. I'm not sure who started that idea. Well, uh, Cascadiopolis is not, you know, it's not like one big city through that whole region. It's a, it's a settlement, mm -hmm. and um, there's a lot of m military type people in this settlement, you know, because things are dangerous. And uh, a fellow visits. His name is Tiger Tiger, spelled T Y G R E, like uh, Blake does in his poetry. Um, so it's, it's not an apocalyptic thing it's i i thought jay lakes was you know pretty gloomy um but it wasn't like an apocalypse it was like a, a kind of a future evolution of the united states because some of the other parts of the world are doing just fine and he talks about that as well mm -hmm. and then in stochasta city by tobias Bakel, he talks about detroit michigan and um kind of how uh, you know the skyscrapers have no owners and uh, the the main character lives in the suburbs, and the suburbs are called the wilds, you know, because they've been abandoned. Mm -hmm. um, the whole idea of living somewhere and driving to work became, you know, unsustainable. It, it has a lot of interesting stuff in it. Um, uh, he called uh, something turking. Have you ever heard of the term turking? Mm, no, but know it sounds interesting. Yeah, I don't know if this is something that he made up or if it's really done, but... Uh, uh, turking would be, um, l let's say you want to look for someone's face in a video, right? Mm -hmm. So what you do is you post the person's face and you post the video you want searched on the internet. And then you s basically say, I will pay whoever gives me the answer. Um, another example would be, you want to, a package to go to Los Angeles. You take the package, you'd write, this package needs to go to Los Angeles, it's worth this much to whoever brings it there, and then you just put the package on a street corner, and then whoever's going that way will pick it up and take it there, and then report that it's been delivered, and then they get paid. Mm. So they call that, he called that turking. And, um, Sounds very uh, alternative economy. Yeah, yeah, it's very alternative economy, and that was really interesting, you know, because the main character was into that, you know, and they would have him do stuff like go to this street corner and um, report how many of these types of people walk by. I'd like to hear the etymology of it. The first thing I thought of was that uh, the Turk, you know, the mechanical um, chess playing machine from the 1700s mm -hmm. or 1800s, um, where it was, it was like a, it was like a early version of deep blue the idea is uh -huh. you, you 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 sit down opposite this um mechanical chess playing machine it looks like a um a turk mm -hmm. who will play you in chess um but i believe it it was like a guy in underneath like playing it so that you're not actually playing a, a chess playing machine you're playing a person but you think uh -huh. you're playing a machine um so maybe it's related to that i i'd like to I'd like to find out more about that. Yeah. Sounds yeah. interesting. 
Right, it is. It's very interesting, you know, and uh, like I said, I've listened to about half of the Elizabeth Bear story called The Red in the Sky is Our Blood, mm-hmm. so I won't talk too much about that other than uh, Candace McClure, who's also a uh, Battlestar Galactica actor. Um, she's terrific. I, I love her reading. Um, so the the whole thing, you know, just judging right now, I'm halfway through it, and uh, it's, a, it's a big success as far as I'm concerned because... Um, they they created a, a really interesting world. There's a heck of a lot to think about, you know, uh, where we could be headed. A lot of ideas flowing through. Uh, you know, Jay Lake did a lot of the heavy lifting there. Um, you know, I say it was info dumpish, but it was not in any way dry. It was completely interesting all the way throughout. So, um, you know, yeah. you stop the audio and think about it, you know, what he's saying. Um, and, info, dump, uh, info dump can be a... Um a pejorative but <clears throat> mm-hmm. um if if you didn't think all the time while you're listening to it oh info dump info dump um if you're just t- t- talking about the uh the way to describe it uh what's happening mm-hmm. like right uh then it maybe it's not an insult so uh were you saying like it could it should have been worked into the story better no no absolutely not i i'm just saying that he packed a heck of a lot of stuff into that first story and I think that it pays off probably in the rest of the stories. So they're um, they're a shared world rather than just like a shared uh, oh, concept. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I was I should have made that clear. Yeah, all all five stories um, set uh, in, in the, the same universe. Of, they're set in the exact same universe. Huh. Yeah. So the authors okay. all got together and they worked out this uh, future uh, world, and then they each wrote a story in it. That is cool. So yeah, it's all in the in the same world. And um, what I also like is it's, or like audi- that, just it's, a, it's not just an audible exclusive. It's it's audio exclusive. It's it's not there is no paper version. That's right. That's I don't right. know there if there's no even version. a plan for a paper version yet. Is there? Um, well, I was reading on um, John Scalzi's blog. Uh, somebody wrote a comment. Hey, is it going to be available in paper for those of us who don't like audio? <gasps> yeah, those uh, fools. And Scalzi said, No, there is no plan right now. Cool. Or uh, ah, a paper ah, version. Ah. <laughs> so, um, but it's terrific, you know. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, yeah, Audible did wonderful job. <clears throat> so anyway, yeah, so far well worth it. It's it's released on October twenty first, which is Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. And they also have the first story in the Forest of the Night by Jay Lake, um, read by Michael Hogan, is available for free. You know that that's what I was like. I, I posted a story to here's a link. Uh, to the you know a, a, a snippet from it, and then I posted a story about the entire thing, and then I have to go and post a third story. Uh, they really they suckered me in there. I I, I thought they weren't <laughs> going to do that because they're giving away a a free download. Uh, well, not a free download. They were giving um, an advanced uh, copy of the um, that first story that they eventually ended up giving away. Mm-hmm. So. Um, if you purchased it, you get it as a pre-order. You get the first story, the Jay Lake story. But they suckered me. They 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 made me think they were gonna do it, and then they did. I hope to have a review posted on the site on Tuesday. Who's uh, um um I think I know who you would choose, but whose story would you be looking forward to most? You've heard two of them, but which one of the um, of just going by the author names, which one would? You say that's the one. To be honest, when, when I first saw it, it was Tobias Bakel was Ah, mine. interesting. Yeah, and um, yeah, I, I I loved his story. I thought it was terrific. Um, ju- from the people who are left, I've never heard anything by Carl Schrader yet. Um, so I'm I'm looking forward to that, and then of course John Scalzi. Um, I'm interested to see what uh, Scalzi's tone is because, um. Jay Lake, it, it was very dark mm-hmm. um, and gloomy, and um, Bakel was almost, uh, I don't know, I want to use the word neuromancer-like, but, but it wasn't quite like that, you know, okay. but the tone was about the same. Cyberpunk-ish. You know, cyberpunk-ish, yeah, and, um, you know, Elizabeth Bear was, is a little bit brighter. Um, just because of the the main character, um, so we'll see. You know, if Scalzi is, uh, if it, if his tone is dark or not, because that would be a first if he was, I think. But I haven't read all his stuff yet. I read uh, Old Man's War. 
Brandon Sanderson is a fantasy author, and uh, his first novel has just been released on audio from recorded books. Um, it's the name of the novel is Elantris, E L A N T R I S, mm -hmm. and the narrator is Jack Garrett, and that is a name I'm not familiar with. So um, hopefully that'll come our way, and uh, we'll take a look at it. Brandon Sanderson, he writes, you could call it a uh, hard fantasy. And by that I mean um, there's a magic system in his books, but the magic system almost works like a science. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's not it airy be, fairy magic; it's hard, hardcore. Yeah, it's hard because it's got hard, fast rules, and uh, you know, just like science does, it's almost like a, a extra science in this world that uh, the rules need to be followed in order for it to be successful. Have you read so, um, the uh, uh, Magic Goes Away series by um, Larry Niven? No, I haven't. That that is excellent hard hard fantasy. I think that's the original hard fantasy. He's mm -hmm. got he's got his magic system in that th that series of stories is um, magic is driven by something called mana, which makes sense, right? Um, mm -hmm. And mana is a property found in um, in matter. It's like a, a non-renewable resource found, uh, it's kind of like gravity. It's anything that has a ma mass has, has mana, but mana mm -hmm. goes away um, as, as magic taps into it. Um, the mass is still left, but the mana goes. Um, so areas of the earth um, with very little human a action are full of magic, right? But the well-traveled right. parts, parts of the earth are almost magic free because as the centuries have gone by and human beings learn to tap into magic the uh, or into mana the magic has gone away and hmm. he puts all sorts of really interesting explanations you know uh sort of meta explanations as to why things are the way they are on earth so one of the things he talks about is back in the old days right when mm -hmm. magicians were really magicians because they, they had lots of power, um, they could do almost anything. They could, uh, you know, walk across the sky, uh, you know, sit on a cloud and float across the sky because they've got lots of mana. But if you fall, if you fall into an area of well-traveled um, um, magic use, uh, <laughs> your, your, ma your mana resources are gone and you'll, like, fall down to the earth. Uh, hmm. And there was there's all sorts of magical creatures too. So like a unicorn, uh, unicorns used to be plentiful because they are uh, biological creatures with magic in them. And if they mm -hmm. don't have, uh, if there's no magic, they die. They wither away, and they get harder and harder to find. So finding dragons is the sa the reasons dragons aren't seen m much in our day, is because there's almost no magic left. Right. So this right. this sort of fits in with the here there be dragons you know parts of the map where uh -huh. uh, you know off in the edges uh, they'll have you know sea sea creatures or whatever and as we as we travel into those areas we use up the uh, the magic um, they go away and we say oh well that was just a myth you see you see the logic there sure yeah it's really really clever one of the things that really struck me too is he's saying there there's still magical creatures in on the earth but if they if they don't go away in the uh in you know the large large creatures if the large creatures don't go away the, there's still the small the creatures that didn't disappear in the way we expected so he talks about how paramecium and um uh the what one of the squidgly ones that stick out their pseudopods amoeba um, mm -hmm. Those are magical creatures, um, but they are withering away in size. They used to be the size of buildings. Now they're <laughs> the size of little microscopic creatures because there's so little magic left here and there. They, they you know, they're just withering away. Uh -huh. um, but it sort of fits in with the sort of Dungeons and Dragons monsters. You would, you know, you'd be walking down a hallway uh, or some dungeon and you'd see a giant uh, amoeba coming at you. Well, you won't see that anymore because they're all squished down to uh, 
the tiny little size they are because there's so little magic left in the world. Very clever. Oh. Very, very clever. <laughs> and he's, he, he'd always work in a plot about some evil magician who's been alive for, you know, 700 years working on magic. And every time he uses, uh, uses up some magic, he gets a little older because he's being only kept alive by, uh, by magic, uh, by mana mm -hmm. still left in the world. Yeah. So, yeah. That, that'd be a well, great, great series for audio. Yeah, it would. That sounds like it. Yeah, and Brandon Sanderson, um, you know, Elantris is his first novel. It, it was published a few years ago, though. And um, he's also got a trilogy out called the Mistborn Trilogy. Mm -hmm. um, the third book was released last week in that trilogy. So he's got four novels out. And he's also the person who's going to finish the Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series. Now, his Mistborn uh, trilogy is also going to be put on audio, but not by recorded books. I understand that'll be uh, Macmillan Audio. Um, I just checked their site, and it, I don't see it as upcoming yet. But uh, as I understand, they're going to put those on audio. Um, and then the 12th book of the Wheel of Time series, probably when that comes out is when they'll publish the rest of them. Because that's the company that publishes uh, the Wheel of Time series as well. Mm. So, of course, I'll give a full review of it. Mm -hmm. um, I've read the novel, um, but I'm looking forward Elantris, to hearing Elantris, you mean, right? Yeah, Elantris I've read, yep. Cool. Um, another interesting thing about Brandon Sanderson is um, he's got a podcast. He and two other fellows um, do a podcast called Writing Excuses, which is just a fantastic um, writing advice podcast. Each podcast is about 15 minutes long. Um, and each of them uh, takes on a different topic. So uh, the hosts are Brandon Sanderson and then Howard Taylor, who does a web comic called Schlock Mercenary. Oh, yeah. So it's schlockmercenary.com. Um, he's in there. And then a fellow named Dan Wells, who is a horror novelist. But he I don't think his books are out yet. He's sold two, and um, they are awaiting publication. Are, so, are these guys local to you? Because uh, I hear I've they are. They're about they're them local before. to me, you know. And I've met them, you know. I doubt that they know who I am or not. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I've met them several times because every year, you know, there's a conduit. Uh, the local convention in Salt Lake City is called Conduit. So and you meet them every year, and they, they I, I they see them every year, you, you know, and they here. they know me by face probably. Okay. You know, I say, oh, here here he comes. Here comes again. our stalker. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, that's cool. But yeah, yeah, it's fun. In fact, I'm on one of those podcasts. Oh, I asked a I asked a question that the last conduit they did uh, a live show. Um, they actually recorded uh, two or three episodes. Actually, mm -hmm. I think it was three. And um, I'm in the second one. I just asked a question about, uh, um, hey, you know where the end of your novel is, but you're off track in the middle. How do you get from the middle to the end? <laughs> Basically, um, did they give you the some tracks. good advice? Yeah, they gave me some really good advice. In a, in a few words, it was blow something up. <laughs> yeah, they uh, said, uh, yeah. you know, you're you're once you get to that point where you're 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 meandering in the middle, um, they said you're you're boring yourself. Mm. So you need to uh, you need something to shake it up. And to get the story moving. That is good end. advice, I think. I, it, it really I is. I think that yeah. that's and it, that's it the, helped a great deal. <laughs> I can tell you that. That's the part of the novel where I'm going, oh, where's this guy going? And then, sure. oh my God, what happened? <laughs> yeah, and um, I mean, every podcast has uh, great stuff in it. Um, I'm just looking at their thing. Uh, episode 35 was uh, published on October the 6th and uh, voice, tone, and style. And these are little 15 minute 15 minute um, podcasts. So, boy, they don't take any time at all to hear and, um, boy, they, they give you a heck of a lot to think about and then, you know, you wait till next week and you think about it all week or or uh, jump right into your writing with it. Well, um, um, Writing you Excuses episode it. 34 was called What the Dark Knight Did Right. Oh, the movie. Yeah. Okay. Yep. They blew something uh, up. <laughs> <laughs> Writing Excuses, episode 33, side characters. So, um, 
yeah, it's all very practical, very good stuff, and and it's, they're fun. I mean, the guys are fun too. They, they, uh, they all three uh, have a great time doing it. Sure sounds like it to me, anyway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I got a new title. Just I just spotted it on Audible. Um, mm-hmm. It's a. It's struck me in a couple of ways. It's uh, from Blackstone. It's called "The New Adventures of Mickey Spillane's Mike Hammer," um, hmm. which I think is uh, interesting because uh, Mickey Spillane died, I guess, last year, the year before. Um, but it's by Falcon Picture Group. That's that's the author. So. Um, wondering what that means exactly but it, it i believe it's it's audio drama um with oh. stacy keach uh in the yeah now now stacy keach didn't he play mike hammer mm-hmm. on hbo or something mm, yeah tv uh tv version are uh i think that, that's my only uh is that's the mike hammer we know basically okay um, i didn't know if it was a print thing to be honest with you i really don't know is he uh, a collection of novels, or it looks like is he on TV only? Uh, oh, him? My, uh, well, yeah, Stacey Mike, Mike Hammer. Uh, oh, Mike Hammer is a is a character from Stacy uh, from Mickey Spillane's um, novels. Um, okay. And there's some um, some of my favorite film noir, you know, Mike Hammer inspired or Mike Hammer movies. Um, really old stuff and then there was a tv series i guess it was hbo or abc or something like that in the 80s um with stacy keach for a couple of years but he's also done some uh audio work before or since then um audio drama work but this this could be pretty interesting and just read the description here everybody loves a mystery and nobody solves them like my camera yeah he usually goes around beating people up. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, he's, he's, you know, Sherlock Holmes is deducing things. Mike Hammer's just s- hitting people <laughs> until they <laughs> give him the information. While uh-huh. other detectives bend and manipulate the law, Hammer holds it in total contempt, seeing it as nothing more than an impediment to justice. The one virtue he holds in absolute esteem. Now the no-holds-barred no holds private eye uh, returns along with his gorgeous secretary, Velda, uh, cl- uh, cl- in a new collection, wait, and a collection of New York City characters in two fully dramatized theater of the mind audio adventures, Dangerous Days and Oil and Water. Narrator, narrated by Stacey Keach, an acclaimed actor who starred in the original Mike Hammer television series, these new mysteries are written by the writers of that show and enhanced with a full supporting cast, sound effects, and music. Even the show's jazzy theme song is back to set the gritty tone for each episode. That sounds awesome. Hmm. It does. The um, a lot of people criticize Mickey Spillane's writing as being, you know, um, it's almost like um, too male, too, too ridiculously punching everything all the time. Um, and it is, it's very different from a lot of mystery and crime writers. He's, he's sort of got one end of the. PI spectrum completely to himself and um, I think it actually works very well in audio I've heard some audio drama of my camera stuff before I believe and I believe it works really well or at least I've heard some audiobooks of my camera uh, stories mm-hmm. so this should be this is a really interesting release it came out two days ago well wow. I'll we'll have to see if there's a Hard copy release from Blackstone. Yeah. Also got um, I spotted another one on. I, that's one of the cool things about Audible is I can use it as a, as a resource for finding what's coming from regular publishers because they seem to get things a little bit before the even regular publishers are out. Yeah, they do. Uh, Fullcast yeah. Audio has something coming out, and they've even got art for it, which. Uh, they don't have on the podcast audio website. They've got um, new uh, Robert A. Heinlein short on uh, short novel, not a juvenile novel called uh, Red Planet. You heard oh, that one? Yeah, I have heard. I've heard of it. I have not read it. Oh, that's one to give to your kids, man. It's pretty good. <coughs> oh, great. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. It's uh, got a 
great new cover. I heard a little the ac excerpt that's on um, Audible here. I also wrote to um, Bruce. Is it Bruce Colville? Yeah. Yeah. I wrote to Bruce Colville and said, "Hey, what's this story on this? When's it coming out? Hard copy? Blah blah blah." And um, hopefully, I'll hear back from him. the um, these series of um, audio dramas from our. They're not audio dramas. They feel like audio dramas because they're so. You almost forget there are no sound effects. It's just it's just mm -hmm. a reading uh, by a big cast, and um, they are so well done as to be awesome. Uh, so oh yeah, it says released uh, on, this agree. week. Um, it must have been straight to Audible first, and now it's gonna you know hopefully there'll be a hard copy coming after that because this is one you wanna you know give to your kid. Um, it's about oh, a brother and, brother and sister. Grab a copy. Yeah, it's a brother and sister on Mars. Um, the uh, older brother is um, he's just you know your typical Heinlein kid. Um, he's got a pet uh, that's a Martian animal, um, and it all it actually all ties into his regular science fiction universe of um, you know regular I guess what's it future history series. Mm -hmm. Robert Heinlein's feature history series. So, this this tiny animal ties into the plot, and um, the younger sister's uh, super genius. Um, the oh, the animal, the alien animal's uh, name is Willis. By the way, I thought that was a nice tribute by Heinlein to me. <laughs> yeah, Jim Marlowe's mm -hmm. Martian pet Willis seems like nothing more than an adorable ball of fur. But Jim's devotion to the little creature will soon lead him and his pal Frank into a death-defying trek across Mars. From 1949, very early um, Heinlein juvenile, and uh, this is one of the rare, rare Heinleins that has been adapted to video. There, this is um, a Heinlein that was adapted by Fox uh, Cartoon. Uh, Fo uh, it was called Fox Kids. Uh, the same people who did the X-Men uh, uh -huh. Saturday morning uh, cartoon also did a mini series of Robert he Robert A. Heinlein's Brent Planet. Um, they changed quite a few things for no apparent reason, but uh, that was really cool to see a, one of the books you've read adapted to a cartoon. I'd love to see that happen a little more often than you know the endless endless um, adventures with nobody actually in any jeopardy. Right. The novel, you know, it, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it worked great as a uh, little cartoon miniseries. Oh, great. Yeah, I completely agree with you on uh, full cast audio, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, they are consistently excellent. Um, they, they do a lot of uh, fantasy as well in the, the Heinlein juveniles. Um, some of the ones that uh, pop to mind, uh, The Princess Academy... Mm -hmm. I think it's just called not the. I think it's just Princess Academy by Shannon Hale. I gave that a uh, essential status. Mm -hmm. um, it was absolutely terrific. It's a it's a YA uh, fantasy novel. I'd I'd like to see what they could do with an adult uh, book. Uh, they they are mm -hmm. all YA as far as I can see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that doesn't fit with the family friendly as much as. Uh, <laughs> Uh, which is really what their idea, right? They're mm -hmm. they're a very family friendly audiobook uh, company, right? But I I I'd like to hear a um, you know a full cast reading of Neuromancer or something like that, something right. something with a little more heft. Because I swear you 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 sort of think of it as an audio drama, even though there's no sound effects and no music. I, there are music between, you know, chapter breaks or something like that, but it's just people talking and performing the lines. It's amazing. Right, it is amazing. And, and um, I don't know, you and I have heard lots of full cast read audiobooks, and generally, to be honest with you, they are not very good. Um, in, in my opinion, they, you know, you've got to have consistency in the actors, you know, um, and generally what we have is maybe a strong narrator and then very poor actors. Mm -hmm. And the other part that, that I dislike is uh, 
you know, somebody will say something in anger, and then the narrator will read, he said angrily. Yeah. Oh, my God. You know, oh, that, I just hated that. Yeah. Um, full cast audio does edit just a little bit. Um, it says on there some of the attributives. So if somebody says something in anger, they're not going to say, he said angrily. That's um, right. They'll just, and, just um, make it... it, it it's. I think that the, when I first heard about that, I thought it was a terrible idea. You shouldn't abridge a book at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but listening to it, I gotta tell you, they got it exactly right. Right. Yep. And, and I completely agree. They they've really, you know, they've done them so many of them that way that it's. Um, boy, you can really count on them. Yeah, I've never um, heard a bad. That's going to be a great. The... It's going to be a great performance. Um, if the book is good, it's going to be a terrific audiobook. It is amazing. Looks like uh, on Blackstone Audio, the collected stories of Philip K. Dick, Volume One, will be released next month. Uh, Talk about from that who? Next month from Blackstone. Yeah, that'll doing be nice. Volume One. It's a uh, eleven CDs long. So, oh, this is exciting. Nine works: Autofact, Progeny. The exit door leads in, a little something for us Tempionauts, The Last of the Masters, The Preserving Machine, Novelty Act, The War with the Finals, and The Electric Ant. I've, uh, the Electric Ant is terrific. That's one of my mm -hmm. favorite um, stories by Dick. And then uh, Collected Stories Volume 2 is released in December, and it's got uh, Colony, Upon the Dull Earth, the Short Happy Life of the Brown Oxford, Faith of Our Fathers, The Days of Perky Pat, The Variable Man, and I Hope I Shall Arrive Soon. Wow, those sound great. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, they, they didn't put any of uh, the um, the most popular ones, the ones people everybody recognizes. I'm glad, and, because and, who wants yeah. to hear stuff we've already heard before? That's right, that's right. He wrote a ton of stuff, so it's it's nice to see um, the. Uh, I'm I, I'm not sure. Maybe two or three of those have been done to audio before. The Electric Ant has, uh -huh. but yeah, it's not oh, available well. anymore. So, Blackstone also has uh, Inferno by Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell. Oh, really? Is that out already? Yeah. No, it's not out already. It's oh, currently. I gotta get it's, that. It's uh, it's listed for December. I gotta get that. Oh, dibs, yeah. dibs, dibs, dibs. <laughs> All right. All right. That's awesome. Uh, let's see. One I thing I haven't kept up with, uh, in fact, that's another new release, is David Farland. He's another local author to me. Mm hmm. Um, David Farland's guy. The Rune Lords. I'm hoping that's headed our way because uh, that is a terrific book. Rune Lords Book One, I've read. And uh, it's really great. Um, it's another fantasy novel by David Farland. Uh, it's book one of the Rune Lord series. Um, the subtitle is The Sum of All Men. And uh, it was released this month by Blackstone. So hopefully we'll see that. Sounds great. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting one. It, it's kind of a... Um, I don't know, more in the Dim Dungeons and Dragons tradition. Mm -hmm. um, but basically the magic in this one is uh, you can take attributes from people. Basically you're borrowing them, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want someone's strength, what you do is you basically brand them with this branding iron, which is uh, where the rune comes from, and then you brand yourself. So now you have that person's strength, and then that person has no strength, and that person will need to be taken care of. So these lords collect attributes, right? Mm -hmm. And all of the people that have given up their attributes live in almost like a monastery kind of a thing um, where people take care of them. Mm -hmm. And if uh, someone is fighting you, if they could destroy the people whose attributes you have taken, then you lose those attributes. So if you take someone's strength and that person dies, mm -hmm. you lose that strength that you were given. So, so we've got off-screen off action as well as on-screen action, or we'll be <laughs> switching back and forth from uh, yep. points of view. Ah, that's, right. That's interesting. So some people, of course, the evil ones, um, steal their attributes. They uh, get slaves and 
um, basically forcibly take their attributes. Mm. <laughs> and then the good guys, uh, people donate them. Aw, that's so generous of them. <laughs> I want to get bad. branded. Where do I sign up? Mm-hmm. Yep. Clever. Um, really good book. Clever really good idea. book. I, I, I have no idea how many he's written now. You know, it's at least six. Um, but the first one was terrific, and I haven't read past it. You did say it was a fantasy book, so it is at yes. least six. That's how the rule is. <laughs> Minimum six. Six fantasies. Must have six. Minimum six. Minimum of six. That's right. Check. If you're, if you're in the fantasy club and you haven't done six, you're not really a member yet. <laughs> fully fledged. I just released this week also uh, from LibriVox, Collected Public Domain Works of H.P. Lovecraft. This is 24 new uh, recordings. Some of them have been released before, but I didn't see this coming, and it's going to be hugely popular is my guess. 24 short stories or um, novel novellas, novelettes by H.P. Lovecraft. Wow. He's going to be famous. He's going to be famous, man. He's going to be famous. telling you, this guy, he has a big career ahead of him. <laughs> that's neat. Just in time for Halloween. Yeah. Oh, well, that's what I was thinking is, I was thinking about how, you know, you say October is uh, Ray Bradbury country or whatever. Um, uh -huh. I'm thinking um, Ray Bradbury can be October-ish, but um, his, his, he doesn't exactly fit in with frightening you know he's well yeah he's that's more true. uh he's more like um uh autumn ennui <laughs> <laughs> i guess whereas yeah. hp lovecraft is oh my god my pants are brown <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh yeah well i can't argue with you there yeah um but with the yeah but Ray people Bradbury. seem to seem to do Lovecraft all year long, and uh, you know they'll have <laughs> Lovecraft Christmas songs and stuff. So, uh, <laughs> well, I guess we'll have to reserve uh, Bradbury for the one month. Oh, I, I mm -hmm. updated um, I updated the uh, author pages with recently um recently added stories to, you know, the H.P. Lovecraft and such, but I also posted um, four new, uh, well, semi-new authors to the author pages. Um, somebody asked me to do Lee Brackett, so I did Lee Brackett. There's not uh, a lot. Lee Brackett has audio? Yeah, yeah, not a lot, because mm -hmm. um, uh, being dead, she's not authorizing a lot of stuff, but there's a, there's a little bit of PD material out there. Um uh. Uh, also did Frederick Brown, who um, I I don't know if you've read any Frederick Brown, but he's he's quite the well, he's quite the, the guy. The famous one, the famous one. Knox. <laughs> yeah, the two second story. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, yeah, Knox pretty pretty famous. Um, I also redid this was a lot of work. The um, uh, James Patrick Kelly page we had it, it, it's still linked on. Uh, uh, some websites, but it was completely inaccessible since our switch over to WordPress. Oh, uh -huh. so I redid that, and that's that's up and running. Yeah, there's two. Well, there's three uh, Lee Brackett stories out. Um, well, two of the same one in <laughs> different readings. Uh, Last Days of Chanticore was broadcast on BBC Seven, uh, so I mentioned that. It's fairly frequently repeated, so. You can probably find it just by, you know, keeping abreast of what's going on on BBC Seven, or you can go over to the torrent site, uh, radioarchives.cc, and get it there. Um, uh -huh. A world is born is the the public domain story that's been released uh, as a podcast and uh, through um, LibriVox, and the very early, very early uh, Lee Brackett. Uh, she's an impressive lady. Um, Frederick Brown. Um, he. What I like about Frederick Brown is he's sort of got this style of um, humor 
that works really well in short short stories. Um, Time Traveler Show did a couple of uh, stories. One, Arena. You you probably know that one pretty well. Oh yeah, yeah I do. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, and the uh, one called Expedition. There's also a recently released um, one on Beam Me Up podcast called Earthman Bearing Gifts and that that's a cute little story very Frederick Brown you can you can sort of tell a Frederick Brown story without even having heard you know his name you just know oh that's Frederick Brown story just by the content mm -hmm. um, and then the one I I'm sort of most fond of um, James Patrick Kelly's really amazing but I have been talking about him for so long the one that I I like that is sort of underrepresented and almost nobody likes to talk about is Poor old Mac Reynolds. Um, he's got four stories, I think, released to audio. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got Slow Gin by um, Mac Reynolds. That's That was released through Time Traveler Show. It's a f very short fantasy comedy. Um, newest one is um, I'm a Stranger Here Myself, which is uh, was done for a recent Starship Sofa. Uh, very funny uh, again, it's not a fantasy. It's a it's semi science fiction, um, set in Tangier. Uh, there was a release called Summit through Livervox. That was um, another semi science fiction one. Uh, it, he he's really into politics, uh, politics humor. He's a socialist, communist. Really comes at it from a different angle. Very well written. Very uh, entertaining writer. I thought you had done one on uh, Robert Sheckley. I was just thinking, you know, you're talking mm. about these comic authors, and uh, yeah. I don't see it there. Well, um, do maybe I haven't Sheckley? posted it yet. I I would love to do one on Sheckley. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll put that down as the next batch. Problem is, is he hasn't got a lot released uh, either. Yeah. You know, for yeah. how much the guy wrote, but we'll we'll see what we can do to wrangle up something. I told you um, I watched Religious. Um, oh, yeah. And yeah. I also watched that movie I was telling you I was reading a review of. I went out and uh, watched it called uh, Constantine Sword, uh -huh. based on that book um, and with the author. I think you would actually uh, find not very much any anything at all in it offensive. You had heard bad things about it? Yeah. Yeah, basically that the uh, Constantine's sword was uh, a book about the Pope basically being sympathetic to Hitler is what I understood. I think that well, based on the uh, not having read the book, but based on the film, I think that it's not the case that he makes that he doesn't make that argument. What he makes is um, the Pope is not sympathetic to the idea that the 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 previous Pope, uh, the Pope during World War Two. Um, didn't do enough uh, during World War uh -huh. II. Um, that's that's very clear. And he oh, I see. he mm -hmm. he talks. It's really interesting. He he talks to the history of of the popes um, in Europe, especially with regard to the Jews. What what the popes were doing uh, about anti-Semitism during their reigns and um, it, 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 various times their protectors and various times um, aggressors depending on the Pope and mm -hmm. um, he talks he talks about um, you know his own personal experience very interesting um, documentary I I I think you would quite like it because well, I'll, it, I'll definitely take a look it all the historical stuff that <clears throat> I, I'm aware of uh, with regard to Constantine and the history of the church I didn't see any inaccuracies and that's usually rare to find uh -huh. uh, to find something that you know doesn't slant it one way or another um, it's not really about the history so much as showing parts of history that a lot of people aren't aware of um, you know the uh, there were some things that came up that I think was quite interesting I hadn't realized for example that before Constantine um, the the symbol of the crucifix was not a Christian symbol of of use it was, of course, a Christian symbol of death, but it was not a Christian symbol of life or of, of the church itself. And Constantine uh -huh. was the man who, who made that 
the Christian symbol. Yeah, Constantine was the one who had the dream that converted him. Well, it, right? yeah, a vision of a uh, cross in the sky. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he goes in, he talks about that, and he talks about the history of it. But it's, it's very interesting, and um, he goes around the world, and he talks to people. He, ta he talks to uh, a, f a family who's been living in Rome since the, uh, you know, the Middle Ages, and, you know, been under pr the protection of the, the Pope since the Middle Ages. Um, huh. and they, they, you know, they've survived uh, the Holocaust and all sorts of uh, purges and such. And <laughs> it's it's very interesting story, and I I think I think it bears a, a watch by yourself. See what Great. you have to say. I certainly will. I don't know if I ever told you about this book I have. It's called uh, Science Fiction: uh, The Definitive Illustrated Guide. Guide. Uh -huh. It's read. Uh -huh. uh, it's not read by. It's uh, edited by David Pringle. I've okay. had it for years and years and years. Let me just see what year it came out. Um, 1996 from mm -hmm. Carlton Books. Um, and this is an awesome book. I uh, one of the. I don't keep that many science fiction books. Um, once I've read them. Uh huh. I uh, usually find a home for them somewhere. Um, but this one is really cool. It's got a history of the genre through different different categories. So the first part um, talks about different kinds of science fiction. And this is actually probably uh, this in this is probably this the inspiration for me for classifying science fiction into different kinds uh, on the website. So mm -hmm. uh, Right at the beginning, under the introduction, he's got uh, the definitions of different science fiction genres, so subgenres. So, so, uh, space opera, right? It says, a term used by analogy with horse opera or soap opera for tales of interstellar heroics, usually involving mighty spacecraft and fearsome superweapons. E.E. E. Doc Smith's Lensman novels are archetypical space opera, and the Star Wars films are more recent examples. And then he's got planetary romance, Future cities, disaster stories, alternate histories, right? Um, and each each there he gives examples. And this is like mm -hmm. the kind of book where you say, "Oh, this is awesome! I'm going to go find out this book, that book." Um, but it doesn't just do um, text; it does all sorts of other stuff too. Um, so it goes into the history of and the ancestry of science fiction, um, going back to Thomas Moore and um, early uh, early um, I guess satirists of their cultures um, talks about um, Mary Shelley and Edgar Allan Poe H.G. Wells mm -hmm. there's a um, uh, whole section called uh, Astounding Stories which is um, about the, he, what he calls templates and what I've been calling themes so as I was saying before there's a space opera he, he's got like a, an essay on that, um, a couple, you know, nice pictures, planetary romance, future city, disaster. So I guess meta, Metropolis would fit into future cities. Yeah, Disasters. Yeah, sure the disaster novel, you know, there's a whole series of those. All the John and Wyndham books are disaster novels. Alternative mm -hmm. histories. Prehistorical romances. Now, that's that's uh, a really underrepresented form of science fiction these days. Um, the most recent one would have been the um, one Julie did for her podcast. You uh -huh. know, that's sort of the most recent um, release of a, a prehistorical romance. You know, caveman stories is one way to put it. Um, time travels, obviously, very popular genre. Alien intrusions. I guess that's like an alien invasion story. Mm -hmm. Mental powers. That's one that sort of withered away. The A.E. Van Vogt and, um, you know, um, Slam, that sort of thing, where sure. people have telepathy. That sort of withered away, hasn't it? Um, he's got a the little... Demolished man. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's got a um, category called Comic Infernos, which I think um, is not the greatest... 
name for the genre, but it includes Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and Henry Kuttner uh, sort of stuff. You know, comedic science fiction. Uh-huh. Um, and then he's got a subcategory of motifs. And motifs are, I guess, more like smaller themes or use small uh, recurring ideas in science fiction. Alien life, artificial intelligence, cosmic collisions. Um, now, that one I, it doesn't ring a bell, obviously, but this is another older idea. The notion that the Earth might collide with a comet or a stray asteroid. You know, um, huh, yeah. the day the worlds collided or something sort of story. Um, but I guess, you know, it, there, that's been done in film recently. What with, um, there was a couple of movies where the Earth is going to get hit, hit by a comet or an asteroid. Right? Mm -hmm. yep. Cutting edge technologies. Um, this this he's sort of un, less a little less clear, but he's got like VR, virtu virtual reality, um, uh, blood music. He's got classified in here. Um, nanotech, I guess, is what we would call it now. Uh, nanotech and that sort of thing. And then next category, cyborgs. That was really popular for a while. We don't hear a lot about cyborgs anymore. Uh -huh, uh, that's true. Dinosaur stories, <laughs> a whole subgenre <laughs> of science fiction, and it is. Um, you know, there's uh, the um, Edgar Rice Burroughs books, Lost World, and um, actually that's uh, not Edgar Rice Burroughs, but you know, um, Center of the Earth, where we've got dinosaurs. Um, uh -huh. di the dying Earth. This is the 19th century. It was assumed that the sun's heat was a product of combustion. And the sun would therefore burn out, leaving the earth to freeze. Um, and then we've got examples all the way back from H.G. Wells to um, uh, The Book of the New Sun by Gene Wolfe. Yep. Um, the Elixir of Life, another old-fashioned uh, kind of science fiction, where um, you drink a potion that will let you live forever. Um and he's got examples uh, from <clears throat> Zelazny, This Immortal, and uh, Sailing to Byzantium by Robert Silverberg. Hmm. The Endangered Environment, that, that's a pretty common thread these days. Uh, genetic Engineering, Nuclear War, and its aftermath. The, those, are, those are pretty popular uh, genre in the 80s and 90s. Overpopulation, t tied into uh, environmental issues. Parallel Worlds, that's a popular popular genre. Robots and Android Stories. A couple other categories. Sex Wars. Those are um, gender gender books, all the way back to um, Her Land, which was released on LibriVox. Um, the Female Man by Joanna Russ. Uh -huh. Solar System. Uh, those are basically all those uh, Ben Bovis uh, stories stories set within our solar system. Space habitats. Space travel. That's big, big genre. Yeah, science fiction is huge, man. Superman yeah. and, and other mutants. Um, that was a big, big genre in the 40s, I guess. Super weapons. Suspended animation. That was pretty popular as well. And it still shows up in movies quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Teleportation and matter transmission. Um, sort of uh, not that heavily used, but um, kind of important for Star Trek. Yeah. Transcendence. This is an interesting uh, on uh, genre. Let's see what he's got listed here. Um, I don't see a lot of things I recognize here. Childhood's End. That's a big example. Hmm. Sort of um, childhood's end is very um, it's an interesting science fiction novel because it's it's um, it's almost a religious novel. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think you know uh, Arthur C. Clarke is in general. He just yeah. replaces God with uh, godlike aliens. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yep. Yeah, I guess 2001 is a, a pilgrimage of some kind. <laughs> <laughs> pilgrimage to the yeah. stars. There you go. It is. It really is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
uh, under the surface. These are um, uh, science fiction stories set uh, in the oceans. Oh, can... That's something you don't see too much now. No, but I remember there was um, a series of books by um, Monica Hughes. Do you know who she is? No, I don't recognize that name. Uh, Albertan, Canadian science fiction writer. She wrote tons of science fiction, uh, very thin novels. Guardians of Isis, I guess, one series. But the one uh, really, I really remember really quite distinctly, it may be read it in grade six, uh, something like that. It's called Crisis on Con Shelf 10. And that was uh, uh, underwater, you know, underwater city, uh, teenagers getting into trouble underwater and uh, their communities. But very hard SF, um, you know, what, what happens when you live... Uh, so many pressures down um, and go you know how do you commute to work when you <laughs> everybody lives in underwater domes very right. very well, cool I'd love to hear some Monica Hughes put to audio because she's she's got really short novels very well written um, would make perfect uh, I'll look into that would make perfect stuff and then um, much smaller uh, categories um, cyberpunk, Golden Age, Hard SF, film novelizations, uh, Inner Space. Th that would be the um, the uh, Fantastic Voyage. I'm just I'm just looking in. That's what I was thinking. But um, let's see. In his essay, they came from Inner Space. J.B. Priestley criticized SF writers for exploring the other side of the sun when they should be they would do better to examine the hin hidden life of the psyche. In fact, journeys into the depths of the mind were not uncommon in SF writers, such as Theodore Sturgeon, Philip Jose Farmer. Um, had, they had already integrated such explorations into principal threads of their work. Philip K. Dick was soon to follow, and J.G. Ballard wrote an essay of his own. Um, this became the central document of the British New Wave. Um, so this is more, n not so, this is more like an uh, uh, inner journey. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure how how successful that subgenre is or whatever. Lost races. There's an old-fashioned idea. Military SF. New wave. Science fantasy. What is science fantasy? <laughs> science fantasy is when the the science is so old it's treated as if it's magic, but it's really science. Yeah. Actually, that's what it says right here. Arthur, Arthur mm -hmm. Clarke's dictum, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Sequels by other hands. So that's um, uh, the most, the first is uh, Jules Verne's An Antarctic Mystery, a sequel to Edgar Allan Poe's narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym. Both of those are available through LibriVox. Shared Worlds. Steampunk. This is cool. This is an old book, 1996, but it still has steampunk in it. Don't you think that's cool? <laughs> that is steampunk's cool. Steampunk's so popular now, but um, yeah. listed here under steampunk. Uh, let's see. It says, the term was coined by mocking analogy with cyberpunk to refer to stories which export the anarchic spirit of cyberpunk to alternative pasts where historical fiction characters engage in adventures far wilder than any could have been envisaged in their own day. All this is usually steeped in a thoroughly modern irony. The Vogue was initiated by Stephen Utley and Howard Waldrop's Custer's Last Jump, 1976, and Black as the Pit from the Pole to Pole, 1977, and K.W. Jetter's Morlock Knight, 1979. Although they might as well have borrowed some inspiration from Michael Moorcock's The Warlord of the Air, 1971, and its sequels, and from Harry Harrison's Tunnel Through the Deeps, 1972. Howard Waldrop's subsequent adventures in steampunk include blah, blah, blah. But um, I had no idea steampunk was that old. Yeah, I didn't either. Techno thrillers, TV and radio spinoffs. And that's just like the first, you know, that's the first 40 pages of this book. I'm going to read it some more. I, I read it like every five years or something and always come away. Well, wow, cool. More stuff to read. You bet. And they're well done. These cool. uh, encyclopedic books are uh, pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, All right. Science Fiction, the Definitive Illustrated Guide. 
the ultimate encyclopedia of science fiction, the definitive illustrated guide by, edited by David Prinkle. This has been the SFF Audio Podcast. Please join us at www.sffaudio.com.